The U.S. Capitol attack re-entered the spotlight this week with hearings in prime time. We can't sweep what happened under the rug. But will it change any minds? Do you denounce President Trump's role at all? Why would you denounce President Trump's role? Republican House Leader Kevin McCarthy reflecting on the past 17 months. I condemned January 6th just as everybody else who was sitting in that room. What I really condemned and found out is that you've got Nancy Pelosi playing politics with it. Plus, Ohio readying for a second primary election after the state's redistricting committee failed again to produce a legal map. Candidly, one of my frustrations has been the lack of compromise on both sides. Secretary of State Frank LaRose on the costly next steps. The longest running political show in central Ohio starts now. This is NBC4's The Spectrum with Colleen Marshall. Shocking new video and startling new information about the assault on the U.S. Capitol. Democrats call it a threat to American democracy, but Republicans call the congressional hearings political theater. Welcome to The Spectrum. I'm Colleen Marshall. The U.S. House January 6th committee staged a primetime hearing this week seeking to detail the events of that day, who is to blame, and how to make sure it doesn't happen again. The House January 6th committee laying the groundwork and presenting evidence to show that former President Donald Trump was to blame for the January 6th insurrection. On this point, there is no room for debate. Those who invaded our Capitol and battled law enforcement for hours were motivated by what President Trump had told them, that the election was stolen and that he was the rightful president. President Trump summoned the mob assembled the mob and lit the flame of this attack. Liz Cheney, one of two Republicans on the committee, said President Trump had a seven point plan to hold on to power and remain in the White House, despite being told over and over again by advisors, his attorney general, even his family members, that there was no fraud, that he lost the election. Repeatedly. Uh, told the president in no uncertain terms uh, that uh, I did not see evidence of fraud. How did that affect your perspective about the election when Attorney General Barr made that statement? It affected my perspective. Um, I respect Attorney General Barr. Um, so I accepted what he said, was saying. But it was apparently not accepted by Donald Trump, who the committee says continued a campaign of disinformation and condemnation of his own vice president. Mike Pence is going to have to come through for us. And if he doesn't, that will be a, a sad day for our country. Because you'll never ever take back our country with weakness. No sign of weakness in the never before seen video showing the violence, the chaos, what the committee called the assault on democracy itself. Carefully and professionally produced video of one of the darkest days in history. OSU political scientist Paul Beck calls it important, significant. Fox News refused to air the hearing live and hard right Trump supporters refuse to believe it. It doesn't matter what evidence they present. Those people are not going to change their minds, are they? I, I think that's probably right. We, we live in a deeply polarized society, polarized along partisan lines. Almost any indicator that you look at, if it has a tinge of political parties to it, uh, is going to be polarizing. But Beck says millions of people are in the middle, and it's those Americans the committee is trying to reach. I think the hope on the part of the people that are, are running the hearings is that people who don't ordinarily pay a lot of attention to these matters are going to pay attention, and they're going to come away saying, you know, there was something awfully wrong here. Wrong being that a president is clinging to the hope that he really did win the election, even though uh, you know, there were 7 million votes more for the opponent than there were for him. House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy condemned this week's hearing, refusing to comply with a subpoena to testify and claiming the committee is working to divide the country. Prior to the hearing, I talked with McCarthy, who was speaking in Columbus at the invitation of 12th District Congressman Troy Balderson. I asked him about January 6th and who should be held accountable. 
We're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down. Anyone you want, but I think right here, we're going to walk down to the Capitol. Do you denounce President Trump's role at all? Why would you denounce President Trump's role? What I denounce is anyone who came and entered that building illegally. But just days after the riot, Kevin McCarthy said President Trump bears responsibility for what he called a mob attack. The president bears responsibility for Wednesday's attack on Congress by mob rioters. He should have immediately denounced the mob when he saw what was unfolding. These facts require immediate action by President Trump. Eight days later, after a visit to Mar-a-Lago, McCarthy sang a very different tune, saying Trump was blameless. I don't believe he provoked if you listen to what he said at the rally. You were one of the House members who early on condemned the January 6th uprising and President Trump's role in that, and then seemed to do a quick shift in, in, in your opinion on that. Why shouldn't people view that as hypocrisy? Because that's not true. That's not what happened. Yes, I condemned January 6th just as everybody else who was sitting in that room. What I really condemned and found out is that you've got Nancy Pelosi playing politics with it. You've got Nancy Pelosi who denied a National Guard from protecting that building. And then she puts together a political committee that doesn't even allow a minority group, minority side to appoint anybody to it. This is not a committee that's honest about looking at anything. You know people will say it's ludicrous to blame Nancy Pelosi for the uprising from people who were Trump supporters. No, I did not blame Nancy Pelosi. What has happened here is you had a protest, and we denounced anyone that entered that building. It's been very clear on all sides, 100 percent always done. What I'm denouncing is the politics being played with this. Why wouldn't we look from a fair process with Republicans and Democrats? Why would you deny Republicans from being appointed? Nancy Pelosi rejected two of the five Republicans McCarthy wanted to appoint point to the commission, including Ohio's Jim Jordan. That's when McCarthy made the decision to pull all of his appointees. Still, GOP Representative Liz Cheney, a vocal Trump critic, remains on the committee. And now, Republicans call the primetime hearing and any examination of the deadly riot political theater and an attempt to pull attention away from inflation, border security, and crime. Well, I think Republicans are going to win the majority simply because of what the Democrats have been failing to do. What they have done is made an open border, but they brought inflation that we haven't seen in 40 years by their mismanagement of what they've been spending. At the State House, the commission charged with drawing new constitutional legislative district maps failed to do that again. But in less than two months, Ohio voters will head back to the polls for the state's second primary election. Races to determine Ohio House and Senate nominees were left off May's ballots because of the state's redistricting issue. The Ohio Redistricting Commission first met 10 months ago, and since then, all five of their proposed maps for the state house were tossed out by the Ohio Supreme Court, and they failed to meet the latest deadline set by the court earlier this month. Secretary of State Frank LaRose was one of the members of that commission that failed to pass a map. He spoke with our Karina Chung about how the committee's inaction will cost the state millions. Three elections in one year. Ohio will have a second primary after months of delays and disagreements over General Assembly maps. It was time to run an election. Uh, what the worst case scenario would have been is if we hadn't had any map to run this election. The federal court implemented a plan for the current election cycle, naming a date of August 2nd and implementing the third set of legislative maps after the state's redistricting commission repeatedly failed to pass a legal map. Secretary LaRose is one of the seven on that commission. He says prep work is partially done and will kick back up next week for the primary after the 88 county boards of elections wrap their May primary work. Right now the boards are actually considering candidates making sure that their uh, you know uh, names are correct and that their ballots are laid out correctly uh, so that they can start producing those ballots for, for next week. A second primary will cost an estimated 25 million dollars. We worked with the state legislature to secure 20 million dollars to help the counties cover this cost because I, I made the commitment early on that the counties would not be left holding 
uh, the bag, if you will, on, on paying for this election on their own. LaRose says August 2nd will operate like all other elections. Time for early voting, absentee ballots, and open polls on election day. When it comes to redistricting and the map making process, he believes there should be a pause for now. The voters of Ohio get a chance to make their voices heard about who's even going to be on the redistricting commission. Remember, it's up to them ultimately to decide who the, the seven members of the redistricting commission are going to be. Local for you in Columbus, I'm Karina Chung. There are several important dates coming up for that special primary election. June 17th, military and overseas absentee voting begins. July 5th, the last day to register to vote. July 6th, early in person and absentee by mail voting gets underway. August 2nd is the special election day. Polls open at 630 in the morning. Also this week, hopes that sky-high inflation would level out were dashed with word that it is moving up with an 8.6% increase over one year ago. The Fed now expected to hike interest rates. The stock market plummeted late in the week by 880 points. Republicans blame the Biden administration. Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown sees it differently. The fact that we got through this pandemic and our economic growth afterwards exceeded China's for the first time in 25 years speaks to the importance of investment. Um, doesn't mean we don't have a serious, serious problem. Brown says he believes a big part of the problem for industries, meatpacking, drug companies, oil companies, and international shippers. He says they're charging outrageous prices while they make record profits and the CEOs take bonuses and stock buybacks. Up next, our roundtable weighs in on possible gun reform coming from Washington and a bill at the State House that some say protects women's sports. Others say it puts children at risk of assault and abuse. Joining us on our roundtable this week, Republican strategist Terry Casey and from Common Cause Ohio, Sam Gresham back with us. And gentlemen, so much to talk about this week, but let's talk first about inflation. We saw an 8.6% increase this week from one year ago. People are getting concerned. Gas prices are up. Now it becomes a psychological game, does it? No one knows if they can trust their 401k. No one knows if they can trust the economy is going to recover from this. Well, and the president's approval rating is low and lower, down to about 33%. And those that give him disapproval, 83% of them say strongly disapproval. So clearly the Democrats are worried what kind of baggage the president brings. And unfortunately, he doesn't seem to have an answer on either gas prices or inflation. He's blaming everybody else, but he forgets things the president has that he could do to help solve it. Of course, yeah. the, the, Senator Brown this week had, did blame some others, said for one thing, as an example, oil company presidents taking huge profits, cashing in stock, and not doing anything to help the public good. The, the sad thing about an, uh, inflation is that the really people who control it are industry. They put whatever prices they want to do out there. Now, you, we keep forgetting we were pent up for three or four years where we were not buying things and people were not employed. What would you expect to happen once you let the, the kitty out of the bag and people can go buy things? Inflation, it's predictable. Sam, get in the real world. When the Federal Reserve pumps too much money out, the Congress pumps out too much money, and they aren't careful where you target the money, you're going to create this kind of problem. But there's a lot of blame to, to pass around, but people view the president and his party as the ones in charge. I say that's superfluous. I do. You can play all those games you want. They're going to do this over there. They're going to do... That's not going to make any significant difference. As long as there's price gouging and people are taking profits at such a low, that's not going to change that. We also want to talk, if we can, this week. We have a lot to get to, and I we had the hearing this week, the first hearing from the January 6th Commission, and they came through with what they promised. New video, new testimony, including, I think, what might be the most damaging statements we've heard from then-Attorney General William Barr, who clearly told the president, you lost this election and there's no fraud. His daughter agreed with that. What do you think, Terry? Why are we at this position where he is still holding rallies called Stop the Steal? 
Well, clearly, former President Trump is not a winner out of this when you have your daughter and other key people trying to tell you no. But the attorney general, the former attorney general, summed it up very well. And I said it back uh, in November and December of 2020 that they just didn't have the evidence. In fact, a whole bunch of Trump appointed judges said no, no, no on all the claims that they tried to present in court because they didn't have the evidence to back it up. Colleen, I think there were some very damaging things. The one that nobody wants to talk about is how did the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys go down and look at where they were going to go during this? How did they know to do stack order, where they were going to put? There had to be some correlation and coordination between the two organizations. And then, uh, most profoundly for me, we have to stop coddling these people. People talk about accountability. I'm not talking about put some people in jail. Make sure they stay in jail for, all, for the next 30 years for what they did. They almost killed the goose that laid the golden egg. We would have, our economy would have tanked. Our image across the world would have tanked over this menagerie, this stupid stuff they were trying to do. And I still don't know to this day why didn't the Capitol Police use their weapons? And well, I, I agree with Sam. If you're going to you do the crime, you got to do the time. When you were looking at that video, you were thinking, why aren't they using their weapons? Right. I mean, not that I want people slaughtered, but it seemed, you know, that was their, their line. Right. The line was breached. And we knew that there were members of Congress who might have had their lives on the line there. Were you not surprised when you saw some of that video at the amount of force that was being used against these police and yet they just seem to continually retreat? Well, sadly, the Capitol Police are normally more of a PR device to guide people around the Capitol. And there were some deficiencies in the training, deficiencies in not having numbers of people. And the command at the top didn't make the request when they knew a day or two before they, there was a bigger problem. They so, didn't use it utilize the intelligence I, that they I, have been given. I, I agree. No, there were some real failures. Yeah. Hopefully they learn from that and improve for the future. I also wanted to ask each of you, this week there was talk finally on Capitol Hill in the wake of these mass shootings, yet another one this week, that maybe they're going to talk about some kind of gun reform. Sam, you said you're not too optimistic about no. that. We're going to put Band-Aids on it again, and we're not going to do the 800-pound the, the gorilla in the room. Um, uh, automatic weapons and 18 year olds being able to purchase automatic weapons. Those are the two things. I tell you, if an 18 year old had to throw rocks, nobody would die. But as soon as that 18 year old, and there were two cases where the people who purchased the weapons purchased it right after their birthday that allowed them to go out and purchase the weapon. Something's wrong with this. And well, and I agree with Sam when I read that you had to be 21 in a lot of states in order to buy a pistol, but you could buy a rifle, including yeah. high-powered rifles, at 18, 19, or 20. And that age of young men, hate to pick on them, but they aren't as fully developed judgmentally no, as yeah. they should be. So clearly there need to be some changes. Acting on emotions and, oh, and yeah. impulses more than they would maybe 10 years down there, the road. There's a reason why people that young can't buy beer yeah. and can't buy alcohol. <laughs> yeah. One final thing I wanted to touch on here at the State House is that there is a bill being considered a transgender sports bill that um, there were are strong arguments made that it's a protection for women in sports and critics say you're going to require children going through <laughs> medical exams to have a genital proof right. is this have they crossed a line that maybe they need to go back well, away I think from I think the good thing is Senate President Matt Huffman said, wait a minute, because the House was trying to rush it through. And I think this is one of the virtues of having a separate House and Senate, because that gives a little cooling off period to look at the bill, ask the right questions. And Colleen, sure it's a wedge it. issue yeah. to drive their voters out on something for the midterm. They're probably going to drag a couple other things out as a wedge issue to try and generate the vote. All right. Well, we thank both of you for being with us this week, and we will be right back. Next week on The Spectrum, the January 6th hearing involving the Proud Boys, who say President Trump summoned them to storm the Capitol. We'll have that and the latest on the fight at the local and federal level against gun violence, just as Ohio eases restrictions on carrying a concealed weapon. All of that next week. 
on the spectrum.